Hello Internet, Seth Skorkowski, and today we'll be taking a look at the modern era Call of Cthulhu adventure, Intimate Encounters. Written by Oscar Rios and published in 2016's The Things We Leave Behind, which is a collection of six scenarios written for mature audiences. Intimate Encounters is short, just coming in at 14 pages, and our heroes are tasked with solving a series of strange murderers from whom the media have dubbed the Lipo Killer because they remove all the fat from their victims' bodies. The art and maps for the adventure are presented in black and white. However, a companion PDF, The Mark of Evil, provides color versions of the maps which you can download for free off DriveThruRPG, so I recommend that you pick that up if you're going to run it. The player characters can be hired by one of the victim's families, or maybe they're journalists, or simply they just have an interest in the supernatural and they recognize that some of the aspects of these killings have an otherworldly source. Now, just for full disclosure, I did not run this adventure. I played it as a player with the Glass Cannon Network under Troy Lavalli, which they were kind enough to let me host the video of our playthrough on my channel as a two-part series coming into about five hours between the both of them. Holy crap, you recorded yourself playing? Yeah, we played a news team for a shady conspiracy theorist news outlet, and I was the cameraman, and it was an absolute blast. And now that I've played the adventure, I have some criticisms and tips for any keepers out there who want to run this for their own group. And I'm Jack the NPC. I'm mostly here to tell jokes as I look for love in all the wrong places. But before we go any further, I must warn you that there will be spoilers. So any players in the audience, please stop here. But send your game masters this way to see about running the scenario for you. But if you keep going and you spoil yourself, you'll have no choice but to run it for your keeper and give them a chance to play for once. Okay, Game Masters, let's get this thing started. The backstory is that years ago, the Somerset Grove Industrial Park was abandoned after tenants had experienced some chronic issues with some substandard septic and wiring systems. Since then, the only activity on the site is for a cellular tower that's on the property. Now, three weeks ago, a technician was sent out to this tower for service and inspection, but unfortunately, a power surge due to that substandard wiring mixed with you know, several of the illegal chemicals that have been stored on site, some nearby ley lines, and some very bad luck caused a momentary shift to another dimension where an entity from another reality was pulled in and trapped in our universe. Now, being made of dark matter energy, it instantly began dying once it touched our atmosphere. So, in order to protect itself, it entered the technician's body, taking him over. Now, this entity, being far beyond human-level intelligence, realized what had happened, and it began constructing a device to replicate this process in order to escape back to its own universe. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, the human body that it inhabited began breaking down, and so the creature acquired a new one. So, using a dating website called Intimate Encounters, it arranged for a casual hookup with a woman. And there, in a seedy motel, it switched bodies into this newest victim, leaving behind the husk of its old body, now completely drained of body fat and with its liver being dissolved. A week later, it did it again, and then again after that. After the third body was discovered, the authorities and the press took notice of this, you know, dubbing this a potential serial murderer the Lapo Killer. Now, the adventure takes inspiration from the old Coljack the Night Stalker episode, They have been, they are, they will be. And while it's not mentioned as an inspiration, the adventure bears a few similarities to the old X-Files episode, Too Shy, so Game Masters might want to check both of those out before running the adventure. Now, some useful skills that one or more of the characters should have in order to do this are first some social skills, you know, persuade, fast talk, intimidate, charm, you know, for interviewing witnesses, some computer use, maybe some stealth, and also a solid engineering, which is a very rare skill in the game. It starts off at only 1%, but it is one of the best skills to use to not only solve the adventure, but to discover the reason behind why this entire thing is going on. So, keepers, if you're going to be doing this as a one shot adventure, if you're making pre generated characters, for the players to use, then that's easy. You can easily give them, you know, uh, one of them a 50 or higher engineering, uh, possibly another with a good physics, because that's another way it can be done. Uh, but if you're not providing the characters for your players, you're going to need to give them access to an NPC that does have that skill, which I, I don't find it as much fun to have an NPC make that important role as it is to have a player make the important role. So I'd encourage that you might want to recommend that one of them have a good engineering here. The adventure begins with the discovery of the fourth victim 
victim. The body, like those before it, is in a seedy motel and has been stripped of fat. The module provides us with this map, but again, the Mark of Evil PDF gives us a prettier color version, which I find much easier to read. Reporters and police have already arrived on the seed, and the investigators are going to need to make some rolls in order to get inside. Oh, don't worry there. Sneaking into seedy hotel rooms is my specialty. Now that I hear that out loud, I probably should admit to that. Now one thing is the crime scene shows a dispersal of strange holes around the body, where sparks or drops of this dark matter disintegrated the pieces of the carpet and the bedspread, and the adventure makes no mention if these were the case at any of the other crime scenes, if they had found holes like this. I assume they did, but I also think it'd be really cool if you, you know, maybe mention to the investigators if they're asking about these, that yes, there were holes discovered at the other crime scenes, but maybe the number of them is steadily increased at each scene, you know, as this entity is maybe having more more and more trouble maintaining its form outside of its host body. This can serve as a good clue that something about this is escalating with each killing. Now, at the beginning of the adventure, the player characters should already know or quickly learn several common facts about the lipo killer, but talking to reporters, police, and their own research should glean a little bit more information. One important piece is that anyone investigating too deeply into the killer have had their computers and their servers fried, and it's for this reason that the FBI has been hesitant to assist with this case because they're worried that whatever is doing this might wipe out the entire FBI database. So the cause for this is because the dark matter entity has put part of its consciousness into the net, sort of a, a sub-mind digital watchdog. So investigating these killings online has an escalating chance of being noticed by the entity. Now the first search is no problem at all, but after the first search it increases to 40%, then 80%, then 100% chance of getting noticed by this entity. And if it notices, it's going to fry their computer or take any sort of action against the investigators, such as reporting their location to the police or the story of them being armed criminals, or maybe load a bunch of child porn onto their computer computer and then give the police a tip off about that. It can also freeze their bank account, uh, cause them to get stuck in traffic because it can control traffic lights or getting trapped in an elevator or a subway train or a whole mess of other problems where computers are concerned and computers pretty much run everything. Now, personally, I would hold off on any of those, those escalating things that it can do against the player characters until after the first time that it fries their phones or computers. Like, that's the first one it does. But then once it realizes that the exact same people are now on different devices because they had to get new ones, and they're still looking into this thing, that's when it's going to uh, take that uh, kind of escalated route of having the authorities handle them on some sort of trumped up charges. Now, one hint that you could give your players about the police getting their computers all fried when they were trying to look this monster up is when they arrive at the first crime scene, they see that all the cops are using some seriously old school equipment here. Like, they're taking photographs with cameras that use actual film rather than digital cameras, or maybe they're jotting all the notes down in notepads rather than jotting them down on the phone or in their laptops or that sort of thing. Maybe even they're interviewing witnesses with actual tape recorders that somebody found in some dusty old supply closet somewhere because ain't nobody cleaned out that supply closet in 40 years. So the player characters are looking around at all these cops that are acting like they're in a 1980s police procedural rather than acting like cops in the 2020s should act. That can give them a really good clue that something strange is definitely going on around here. Another key piece of information the investigators can glean is that the security traffic cameras within a couple miles of the murder all shut off for a two-hour window around the time of the murders. Again, this is done by the entity's digital watchdog, and it's also through these cameras that the entity can watch the investigators once it's aware of them. If they draw its interest, it can just watch them through uh, any camera around that's connected to the internet, so it could be an ATM machine or it could be anything. Now, however, the module does offer a really cool suggestion of how the investigators might be able to track this monster down, where uh, within five to six days, once it has to kill again, if they're scanning social media and they're, they're really paying attention, they can see stuff of, you know, people complaining about their cameras just suddenly going out. They can use that to triangulate where this monster is, and I think that's a really cool idea there. Now, learning about the condition of the bodies, including the missing liver and how the victims are also riddled with cancer that they shouldn't have even been able to move, you can accomplish that by talking to the coroner. Now, a few social roles and taking them out to a $25 dinner, that should do the trick. 25 bucks ain't too bad to get a bunch of secret police information. How much did you guys spend when you took them out to dinner? Uh, the dinner came to something like 125. Okay, yeah, you know, four player characters plus that guy that comes to five people at 25 bucks a head, so yeah, $125. I'm in 125,000. Wait, what? 
How in the hell did you guys spin up? You gotta watch the game if you want to know that, but our characters ate pretty well. Researching the four victims gets us more information. Now, a lot of this can be found safely doing searches through public profiles and social medias. So there's, you know, not a chance of the dark matter entity really noticing them for this. Now, all of the victims, they seem to have been overweight and had a history of drinking, which gave the dark matter those nice, delicious livers that it craves. It also displayed changes in behavior in the days leading up to their death, such as uh, changing their profile pictures, uh, listing themselves as bisexual, and being more aggressive and looking for a casual rendezvous. We get pictures of a couple of the victims, which aren't overweight as the descriptions make them sound, so I can only assume these are the newer, thinner profile pictures. I wish we had before and after pictures for them, so we can kind of show that dramatic change in them. It also says that a computer use rule can detect that these newer profile pictures have been digitally altered. Now, I suggest then that a photography skill rule should also be able to do that to detect that these have been manipulated photographs. Also, because the dark matter entity is, is far more advanced than human capability, especially when it comes to computers, but it's also entirely alien from us, I suggest that the clues that the photos have been digital manipulated aren't the normal telltales that people normally find. Like, you know, uh, the shadows and the borders, all of that is flawless. There's no sign of manipulation at all. Uh, but then there's something about the faces, right? There's a symmetry or something about the eyes of this kind of weird, uncanny valley quality to them because they've been made by a non-human creature that, you know, doesn't really quite understand what makes a human look human. So those are the clues that the player characters might be able to recognize as being digital manipulation. Now, with this list of information, it says that the non-italicized items can be found through public searches, but the italicized information requires access to Intimate Encounters database. Unfortunately, with the black on gray, I find seeing which ones are the italics being a little difficult, so I wish it was denoted by an elder sign bullet point being differently, or something a little bit more obvious, or simply done in a way that is conducive to being used in a handout format, such as all the public information was listed at the top of each victim profile, with the non-public being at the bottom, instead of kind of being all scrambled up the way it is. So following all these clues shows a chain between all of the victims, but it doesn't say who the most recent victim was supposed to be meeting in that motel, meaning the player characters are going to have to get that from the Intimate Encounters database. Now, the website's owner, John Nord, is treating this media circus as a, just a big marketing opportunity, and he's refusing to work with the police. He's loudly proclaiming how this is all oppression by the religious right against consenting adults or wanting to have casual hookups, and it's really him just trying to exploit this tragedy. What I want to know here is how many people are still using this freaking website when there is a known fat-sucking serial killer that's been using it to hunt for the victims. Good question. Now, personally, I think keepers should be able to explain this away that a large number of customers have stopped using the website because there's a killer on the loose that's using it to find their victims. However, an equal number of people, maybe even more people, have started signing up for the website. Uh, maybe it's because they like the thrill of that danger. You know, there's a killer on the loose. So that kind of that risk and that gamble and excitement is really something that they're after. Or merely they're people that fetishize uh, serial killers, so they, they have a thing for them. So they're hoping that maybe they can meet this serial killer, even though it's probably going to mean they're going to die. So now we have this huge surge of new accounts that are opening up, and the owner is capitalizing off of all of that. Getting the website's records is going to be tricky for the PCs to do. It might require an extreme fast talk, or intimidate, or uh, maybe bribing the uh, owner, or maybe breaking in after hours, or maybe just simply bribing the cleaning staff, because they're probably a lot cheaper to bribe than the owner is. However they do it, the investigators can get more information about each of the victims. Now, searching the computers at this point might alert the dark matter entity, but it's only a cumulative 20% chance per search as long as they're careful. They'll also find out that the person that the fourth victim met in the hotel was Scott Parker, who's now likely going to be the next killer slash victim. But finding Scott Parker's location is the next difficult trick. No problem at all. I'm just going to catfish it with my own dating profile. I mean, think about it. Overweight, heavy drinker, I was made for this entity. And get this, my username is SuckMeDry44. How is it not going to find that irresistible? And the best part of that, that was already my username to begin with.
Catfishing the monster is certainly a possibility, however with the monster's ability to, to watch security cameras and everything, it can be tricky for them to pull that off. If they don't know that they're looking for Scott Parker personally, they're just kind of throwing some lines out there trying to see if they get a hit, it's going to require a luck roll in order for the entity to even notice them to maybe try to pick them up. Now if they do know that they're going after Scott Parker, or once they have made that luck roll, it's going to require a successful charm or fast talk in order to uh, kind of convince him that, you know, they're the next victim you should have. Now personally, I think that if the attempt fails for that charm or fast talk, if you want to give the monster, let's say, a sense of humor about this, you know, maybe have it be if they fail their roll, he does set up a meeting with them, but it's also with another group that failed this roll, like a police task force or maybe a news crew that's also trying to catfish this monster. So now the PCs find themselves in this awkward situation of, you know, going to this hotel and it's now multiple groups that are confronting each other, believing they've caught the killer when really just the monsters laughing at them. Now, characters might also try to catch the monster by backtracking it back to patient zero, the first victim who was that cell tower serviceman who reported being injured at the industrial park right before all this started. Now, personally, I feel there should be more clues that can send the player characters to the industrial park. Now, our group, when we played this adventure, we broke into Scott Parker's apartment and through his computer, we activated the Find My Phone app, which showed us the park right before all of our phones and computers and everything fried out. So you could, of course, do something like that. But another option that you might try is if the player characters almost manage to catch the killer through catfishing or maybe monitoring his account and you know, uh, kind of crashing his next uh, victim's potential meeting or whatever it is, or if the next victim, let's say, just chickens out at the last moment and they don't go to the motel and all the monsters kind of in the, in the last few hours before his body disintegrates, maybe the creature is then kind of forced to do a hasty opportunity killing in an alley or a car somewhere near the industrial park, and that one really stands out because it's done in an alleyway or a car versus in a shady motel somewhere, and uh, this person doesn't have an account with Intimate Encounters, and maybe they, they weren't yeah, kind of a normal thing. Maybe they, they weren't a drinker. Maybe they weren't overweight at all. So something about this really does stand out. Or maybe if the player characters are monitoring Scott Parker's social media, there's some sort of blip on it, you know, where somebody posted his Facebook wall, you know, hey man, I saw you at this neighborhood, but you must not have heard me yelling your name. Are you okay? You're looking kind of thin there. It only lasts like a minute before the entity deletes this message, but the player characters that might have a chance of seeing this, this clue as to where it is. If the player characters discover the industrial park, they're going to need to break into it. I also suggest because the entity has done the repairs to the cell tower, maybe it did it just a little bit too well. So maybe it could give the cell tower some special properties, like if now it's just super duper powerful, like 15G, and now the, their phones, they start warming up in their pocket or anything like that because there's a massive amount of data is being fire hosed into them and they're not meant to accept anything like this. Or maybe they start doing wireless charging the closer and closer they get to this tower. You know, something saying that, yeah, there's definitely something wrong with this tower because it's working just a little bit too well here. Inside the building, they're going to find boxes of various items that were delivered to build the machine to send this dark matter entity back home. And then further inside, they're going to find this open septic tank, and inside of that is the device itself. Now, this machine is of complete alien design, but identifying its function requires either a successful uh, engineering check, an insane insight by an insane player character, or an NPC engineer to help them out. And this is why I strongly encourage that one investigator have at least a 50 in engineering. That way we don't have to rely on something like an insane insight to give them the clue or rely on an NPC to feed them the information. You know, give them a good chance of getting that themselves. Additional information can also be gleaned with a physics or Cthulhu mythos or a hard engineering check. So for that, I also suggest that you go ahead and allow physics or mythos for that initial check as well. I understand identifying this device shouldn't be too easy for the PCs to do, but the game is just going to be a lot more fun if the player characters at least have an understanding understanding of what the stakes are, as well as identifying this machine is the only real way that the player characters can learn the plot as far as what this entity is or why it's doing what it's doing. Now the machine is going to create a dimensional rift allowing this entity escape back to its own universe but the resulting surge is going to cause an explosion, like a 20 kiloton nuke that's going to kill thousands in the city. Whoa, whoa, whoa! I signed up for this case to catch myself a killer or maybe find some love, but now I gotta defuse some sort of interdimensional nuclear bomb? Who is catfishing who here? 
The PCs can figure out how to safely destroy this device, or maybe they could rewire it so that way it doesn't do this massive discharge when the creature escapes. You know, it explodes, but it only takes out the building that it's in. Now, speaking of which, at some point, the player characters are likely going to have to confront this monster. Uh, maybe they're going to ambush it in a seedy motel. Maybe they're going to find it at the industrial park as it's attaching the last piece to its device that's going to end up turning into this nuclear bomb. Now, when they do confront it, the creature erupts out of its human skin. Now, this thing is tough. It has 100 hit points. However, it also takes damage every single round that it's exposed to air, and even its own attacks against the investigators cause damage to it. Anything that it touches is disintegrate, and the damage that's done has to do with the size of the doomed weapon. So a uh, bullet hitting it only does one point of damage, while hitting the creature with a table would do three points of damage, but it's also going to disintegrate the table. Once the entity has been killed or has managed to escape back to its own dimension, the adventure is done. Now, maybe the player characters managed to stop this device from blowing out a big chunk of the city. Otherwise, people are going to believe this was some sort of terrorist attack. Overall, we had a lot of fun with this adventure. I like that the monster isn't just some sort of evil beast that's bent on world domination, but simply a being that's trying to be just desperate to get back home. Now, my biggest complaint with it is that first, learning about the industrial park itself is very difficult, so I'd like more clues that could send the investigators there. Also, we have no timeline as to how much longer the creature has until it's uh, finished building its device and can escape. Now, the player characters, they do have the ticking time clock aspect that a new victim is going to die every five to six days. So that does put the fire under them that they're going to want to stop this monster before it gets its new victim. And if they fail that, they've got five to six days more before it kills again. But there really isn't any timeline that's given as to when the entire adventure is done because the monster got out of here. So I'd say that maybe give it two more victims after Scott Parker. And if the player characters haven't solved it by then, the creature manages to escape our universe, leaving a smoking crater across one side of the city. But my number one issue with this is that outside of giving the player characters an insane insight, it is near impossible for any of the PCs to figure out why this is all happening in the first place. Uh, because first, I think that's an important part of an investigative adventure is to learn the why. But second, once the player characters uh, know what this creature is attempting to do, why it's you know, doing all this, that can create a possible moral dilemma for them. Now, one idea is maybe we could have some sort of mineral or synthetic crystal dust that was found on the clothes of one of the victims. And when the player characters uh, look into it, they discover how this, this mineral is extremely rare. It's maybe only you know, comes out of one or two places. But a shipment of it was recently sent out to the industrial park on the other side of town. Uh, I mean, I could give them a good clue that they should go out there because, you know, uh, no one else would even seem to have this stuff. And maybe if they're talking to the guy who makes or sells this stuff, they've got this crazy belief that it could be used to break the border between dimensions, like some sort of a mad scientist is the only person that makes this mineral that nobody else seems to have a use for, but somebody at the industrial park just bought a lot of it. Well, maybe, and just going with the mad scientist angle here, maybe when that dimensional rift opened up, you know, there was some sort of evidence, some sort of device was able to pick that up and kind of locate that something weird had happened, right? So in the player characters, they go to this neighborhood because maybe the monster did some sort of opportunistic killing and had to kill somebody there. So they're wandering around the area of the industrial park and they see this weird van driving around. It's got all these antennas and dishes and all sorts of crap like that. And there's this dude in a lab coat going around. He's checking the barrel parametric pressure and EMP radiation and all sorts of stuff like that. And when they talk to him, they find out that he is some weird scientist that got himself kicked out of academia due to his theories. But he has evidence that a dimensional rift opened up and that it looks like something is trying to replicate that process. And he might even theorize to them that, you know, maybe if something fell through that rift into our world, that'd certainly be possible. However, it'd be made out of dark matter, so it would probably start dying the moment that it entered our atmosphere and the air started touching it. And Unless, of course, it was made out of some sort of energy, in which case it could pour itself into a vessel or some sort of way to protect itself, but, you know, that wouldn't work because it would end up kind of ruining its own vessel and it'd have to get a new one and again and again. And the player characters, they might ask, say, well, how often would it need to renew its vessel that it's in? And he'd say, well, you know, maybe every five to seven days. And the player characters would be like, oh my god, that sounds kind of familiar. And then he'd say something like, well, you know, as long as the vessel that it was was able to meet all of its nutrients nutritional needs, you know, it's got to eat sometime. The player characters all of a sudden they realize that this isn't some sort of, you know, monster that doesn't, you know, think or anything like that. It's just killing willy-nilly. 
it's just a guy trying to get back home to its family, right? Its family's probably really worried about it. And Playa Cactus can kind of get a little bit of kind of a, a human empathy towards this thing because it's not actually mean to hurt nobody. It just wants to get home to its kids. So, you know, the Playa Cactus, they go on, they find the monster in the warehouse, they're battling it out, the monster's down on the ground, it's dying. Then you get have the door just suddenly burst open and that scientist come in going like, wait, stop, don't kill it. It's a man. Don't you understand? It's like E.T. It just wants to go home. And the player characters are like, what? And he's like, we have to help it. And of course, that's about the time the entity jumps inside the scientist's body and now the player character's got to cap his ass too. But it does at least add to a kind of a neat little moral dilemma, as well as kind of give a little bit more personality to this monster. You can pick up the things we leave behind on DriveThruRPG as both PDF and physical editions link below. I suggest checking it out. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you want to see some more of our stuff, such as game reviews or Game Master Philosophy, just hit that subscribe button. Till next time, gamers, you have a great day. You know, while I wasn't able to catfish that monster on intimateencounters.com, I have been getting a ton of right swipes recently. Though most of the people doing that are a lot scarier than the mythos monsters I have to fight. Dating in your 40s is rough.